Yes. Great, thank you very much. So as always, we are in week five of our series Get Started and Open Seas with STKO. Uh, we are getting now, we're always using the same structure. Today will be brief, 30 minutes, questions, assignment, and forum. So today we are talking about element properties. This is not strictly like a Open Seas terms, but it's something that you find in an STKO and that you can refer to Open Seas elements. So we're gonna, I'm gonna tell you what's an element property, how to create it and how to assign it as we did for the physical one. And I'm mostly going to talk about displacement and force beam column element because these are the ones that are most used on 3D frame structures. Then how they compare with each other and how to use them. And at the end, I'm just gonna mention some of the other elements that we may encounter in these classes. If you guys have any questions on particular elements, just write them down and we can talk about it at the end. So what's an element property? Element properties are namely the final element formulation of the model that you want to model, of the structure that you want to model. So they are related to the final element method that you're using and the way the solution is going to be identified in your model. In OpenTC, you have many finite element formulations. It's not just a single one as it is in, as it is in, most, in most commercial finite element software. So you're practically telling to your geometry how it should behave in the analysis. One mistake that happens sometimes, like what I was talking about before with Larissa, the, the fact that she modeled a face and she applied a, a load on the face. If the face is not a single element, because that's actually instrumental for the specific kind of load, the surface load inside of STKO, that you can use it with an element, with a geometry that is not an element. But if that, let's say if that face is not a single mesh element, but it's more than one, let's say it's divided in four, the node at the center, if you don't apply an element to it, will not know how to behave in your analysis. So just remember that you have any geometry that you want to model structurally, and you don't assign an element to it, they will not know how to behave in the analysis. The choice of course depends on the material that you want to use, the dimension of the element, or the type of discretization and mesh that you want to apply and the type of result that you want to obtain. For example, we will see the, the, the differences between displacement-based elements and force-based elements. But um, let's say as a general rule, force-based elements, if you're modeling material nonlinearities or nonlinearities in general, you do not need to discretize them to obtain the results that you want. So what it's normally done in two different structures, you use force-based elements because you already have uh, all the effects that you're looking for without having to mesh them as smaller elements. Instead for another application has pile soil interactions, you will have any way to mesh your piles to make the contact elements with the soil. And then it's a, a more obvious choice to choose uh, displacement-based elements. As we've seen for all the, let's say the blocks, that we need to construct our model in open seas, geometry, inter interactions, et cetera. Interaction we haven't talked about actually. Yeah, we did, interactions uh, and physical properties. Now uh, for elements, we see again, there is this the comparison. So whatever is it that you create in open seas, for example, here for this model, we created the columns and the, and the, and the beams with the force beam column element. The same, the same command is in STKO. The only thing that's different, as I mentioned last time, is that the element in STKO will just give you the final element formulation, but the integration scheme is specified in a physical property that you have to assign beforehand. Just see these two examples for the full model and to understand this difference. Has physical properties, element properties in STKO, correspond to all the elements in OpenSeas. For each of them, there's a mix object written in Python. The mix object is created to the work tree. The tag is assigned when you create. And all of the parameters that you have to input if you are writing your own TQL script, are you can find them back again in this mix object inside STKO. Some of them, they are, have to be specified directly. Like for example, here, if you want to use the optionals of the mass, or you have to assign the geometric transformation, you can uh, assign them through the editor of the element property. Some of them are less intuitive, but yeah, more intuitive uh, given that it's a 
a graphic user interface, but you don't have to type by hand which are the nodes of, the, of your element that are creating. You just assign the element to your geometry, and those nodes will be written when Astichio writes the TCO file for you. As for physical property, you can create, delete, clone, edit, assign and assign, etc. all ele element properties. There's no um, light blue and blue color coding system for element properties. It's just, I know actually there is for if you reference, for example, in the inch beam. This I was forgetting this time. So this is actually wrong. You also have referenced and referenced and use. We have to update this, guys. I will do it for you later. But you, so you have the same color coding for the physical properties. And remember that all geometries with an assigned physical property need to have an assigned element properties and vice versa. So you can't just assign a section and do not assign an element to a certain geometry. Something that is really useful to do, I can show you in this model. For example, here we had, imagine that you have a very large model, a very large 3D structure. We have all the beams and all of the column. That this is something that it's really useful to do is to select them through the work tree and then assign the relevant element by drag and dropping, having done your selection before, instead of you know, going like, Oh yeah, I want to select every edge of this one by one. This is something that's really useful because it's very important if you're using, for example, shell elements or other types of elements that do not need to, that need a specific geometry to be applied. You cannot apply, for example, a shell to a beam, to, uh, to a line. So just remember, this is uh, a useful way to do it. And then there's something to remember right now that we kind of gonna talk about it over and over again today that there's different results you can get on being on being column elements. Um, there's results at the nodes, which are interpolated linearly along the element. There's results at the cause point defined by the integration scheme that you uh, identify at the, in, in the physical property. And then there is results at the extremities of the elements. So let's say at the nodes of the elements that can be different on the two sides of each node. So just this distinction can be useful to interpret the results and understand what is it that you're looking at. So the two main beam column elements that are used for, 3D, for modeling of 3D frame structure are displacement beam column and force beam column. These two definitions are actually true for all displacement based and force based finite elements in general. So they are using open season and implemented separately, but in a lot of other software you do not see which one is it that you're using, but you know that this is kind of the two approaches that we have to find that element modeling of beam, of beam elements. So in displacement beam column, displacement is the unknown variable. The element computes the strain from the displacement, gives them to the section, and the section gives the stress results. So this is the things that happens behind the scene. Instead, for force-based elements, uh, the elements assume the distribution of forces. So the, um, along the element. And then the deformations are computed with an iterative process. So there is not an assumption of the displacement distribution, but an assumption of the force distribution. In the first, um, in the first type of assumptions, the deformation is considered continuous along the element. Instead, it's the second time, the force is considered continuous and the deformation is found iteratively. This means that the deformation can be discontinuous here at the end of your process of your analysis. So what is it? This is a very big topic to talk about here, which regards, which is in reference mostly with um, RC structures, but also with other material modeling, with other constitutive, other constitutive behavior, is whenever we want to uh, model softening in a finite element model, we're actually going against what's the basic assumption of our finite element formulation, which is that the solution is continuous. So that we can find a continuous solutions along the element that we're modeling. When we model strain softening, for example, in RC structure, where we're trying to capture cracking um, in our constitutive model, we are saying that the solution is not unique anymore because whenever we have, uh, whenever we start to have the presence of cracks that alter 
um, the, the distribution along the element. The solutions depend on the element size and the integration size. We're not asking anymore the stress to, de, to be transformed, let's say, uh, as in hardening increasingly from one element to the other, but we're asking the section to behave differently along the line of a beam. So in one section, something is happening that is different from all the others. And this is, let's say, against uh, the basic assumption of a continuous displacement field. In fact, displacement jobs are not very good for standard and finite element modeling as we assume that the solution has to be derivable to get all the other things that we want to see, all the other results. However, we still want to use stress and strain models with softening inside. So what we see when we use this kind of model is that strain localizes in a narrow band of elements and that the energy dissipates in a way that depends on the element characteristic length. This is a very crucial aspect because um, what can happen? Oh, sorry, guys, we have someone else. Oh, yeah, we let them in already. Um, what can happen is that what, what happens is that for displacement based elements and for force based elements, this characteristic length changes. For displacement based, it depends on the size of the finite element. So if we discretize our finite element, our characteristic length will change. Instead, when we have higher order integration schemes or force based elements, this characteristic length depends on the integration scheme itself. So if we have an higher number of integration points, we will have a smaller characteristic length, et cetera, et cetera. Therefore, the solution depends on the mesh and on the integration types. And this is something that we really do not like to have in finite element modeling, because we don't know what is the, what is the real solution that is, that is actually representing the structure that we want. It's important to remember it so that Displacement-based and force-based elements behave differently in reference to strain softening constitutive models. And this is true for every, every model, so it's in, for every software. So it's not true just for open seas, but this is to say it's a general rule of finite element modeling. What I would to show you this, there is, this, is an, this is an example that you guys can also open up when I'm gonna give you the support files. I'm not gonna open it up now because it's quite complex. We just printed out the results that are necessary to show. So if you make a, um, an exercise on just a cantilever column and you apply a concentrated load, which is like gravity and horizontal concentrated load on the top, and you try with one force base element with five integration points, then with 10 integration points, then you switch to displacement base with five and 10 integration points again, and you try to discretize your displacement at the end with a, let's say, a simple fiber section as I described to you last time with a, this kind of steel behavior and this kind of concrete behavior, you will see that you have different results for different type of elements. And this is something that is really important to be aware of. What we see in terms of section deformation that we already said before, like at the beginning, just to remember, section deformation and forces are results at the Gauss points not at the nodes, not at the extremities of the element. So when we see, what we see in terms of section deformation is that you can see right away in the uh, first spin column element that there is strain localization. This is because we assume a continuous moment along the element, not a continuous curvature as in the displacement base. And from that continuous moment with the iterative process, the first spin column element can actually yield a deformation that is not continuous. This is a deformation field that is not continuous. With more integration points, we see that the energy dissipated is much less compared to the one with less integration point. And this is also visible here in the stress strain curve that we plotted here. Actually, no, it's the force displacement curve that we plotted here. So uh, the energy dissipated by the second, the, second, um, the second cantilever is less than the one dissipated by the first. Going to the displacement beam, uh, beam element, we see that changing the number of integration points does not change the result in these terms and that the displacement field is continuous. So we, have, we see no differences in between these two cases. But when we start to discretize our, our beam in, with a displacement-based approach, the discretization, the discretization has an effect on the dissipation of energy. So what does this mean? This means that Depending on the type of formulation that we choose for our elements in our 3D frame structure, we will obtain different results. 
And we need to be aware of them to understand what they mean and what is it that we really want to represent. Uh, there is something called uh, energy regularization that is done to obtain similar results in different approaches. So uh, this is just some theory about how to calculate this regularization. The important thing is that you remember that you need to, if you want to use this kind of approach, you need to define a scaling factor compared to a specific reference that you choose. In this case, we choose the first linear axiomal year that we define and the first um, four spin column element with five integration points as a reference base. And we try to regularize all the other elements compared to this one. And we need to, ch to choose a, a scaling factor that, we, that is the ratio between the reference length of your element and the characteristic length in which there will be the localization of the strain. Of course, depending on the amount of integration point, the characteristic length will change. As we saw before here in the fourth spin column element, the strain is localized in the height of the characteristic length that, force, that for fourth spin column element is the integration point size. And for example, if you want to go see what's the integration point size for the standard integration scheme of Lobato, for example, if you go here, in the source code of OpenSeas, I have a link also at the end of my presentation, just for you to know how to get there. Yeah, OpenSeas source code. You open here and you go to uh, source element for spin column or any other uh, element that you want to see. And you can go and look up how the Lobato beam integration is divided uh, depending on the amount of integration point that you define. If you go down, you see you have in case when I have two elements, when I have three, sorry, when I have three, two points, three points, four points, etc. Remember that it's like it's a variation between one and minus one. So if you want to make a ratio and obtain a percentage, you have to divide by two. So once you let's say study what's the characteristic length of your first spin column element, or let's say the size of your element, and say in this case for displacement beam columns, it's important to have the size of the element as let's say the, the dimension in which the energy will be dissipated, you can redefine your structure and obtain the, some results that are much different, much more similar to each other compared to what happens in the beginning. So as you can see here now, we obtained some, in terms of energy dissipation, we obtained closer responses after regularizing the material characteristics. But uh, we do not have closer responses in terms of strain. We cannot regularize the strain of our elements. We can just regularize the energy dissipation. Of course, the, as you can see here, the red line, the displacement-based response have come closer to the force-based response if discretized. So the furthest ones away are the displacement-based elements without discretization. So just to recap a little bit, strain softening is hard to model in FEM, uh, and it, the energy is dissipated differently based on the type of elements that you choose to model your structure. So if you choose force spin column elements, you will see localization. If you choose displacement spin column elements, you will see localization only if you discretize your structure very, very much. You can use fracture energy regularization. Actually, I didn't tell you we have a little Excel file that I prepared that you guys can use if you want to, let's say, paste your input uh, material properties. And then, of course, your scaling factor based on the type of elements that you're trying to target. And so then, let's say, uh, integration size or element size. And then copy paste your ultimate strain regularized, or in case you're using concrete zero two also, then some response regularized. So this will be in your materials at the end of this class. Now, this, let's say, what we talked about until now, it's something in just in terms of, um, it, it refers to both displacement-based and force-based approach in general, not just in reference to open seas. In reference to open seas, there is two things that I would like to make you notice in, in reference with these two elements. So if you want to model shear response and you're using, for example, fiber sections, which are the most used ones for 3D frame structures, 
you know that you know by now that they only deal with PMM components. So it's just an euler bernoulli formulation. If you want to include shear, we talked about this last week. So the Moshenko formulation, you need to use a section aggregator. A section aggregator, it's like a container that allows you to assign more than one material property to the same element, physical property to the same element. Um, so the shear forces at the element level are always in equilibrium, but at the section level will be in equilibrium only if you include them in the section aggregator. Of course, you should regularize this stress and strain shear law as usual, but the, the important thing to remember is that you, if you want to use displacement beam column in open seas, they do not support shear deformation. But this is not because displacement phase elements do not support shear deformation, but that the displacement beam column was formulated just to uh, model a Euro Bernoulli formulation. So if you want to model shear, you need to use force beam column elements. This is just an example of what you will see if you model a structure with a force beam column element this one and uh, a pinching material to model your shear, you will obtain, without, without shear, you will obtain this kind of, of behavior um, subject to horizontal loading. And with a pinching, you, you will be able to capture shear failure exactly like this by using a section aggregator. If you do not use a section aggregator, you will never be able to obtain this response. And of course, remember, just with a force beam column element. Another difference in the, in the way force-based force and displacement-based elements are implemented in OpenSeas is the way element loads are computed inside these elements. So again, the displacement beam column assumes a continuous displacement field along the elements and then computes the, form, the forces. Instead, the force beam column assumes uh, forces continuous along the element and then iteratively finds the deformation. So if the deformation is on one side computed uh, continuously and on the other side computed iteratively, what happens is that um, in reference to the element load in the displacement beam column, at let's say in this case like this in which the base of the, of the columns is fixed and the top is just applied with a roller. So this point can only move in the plane here. And we apply an element load along the whole, all the sides of the element. What happens here in the form, in the calculations inside is that um, the element looks at the nodes. It sees that the nodes do not have any movement. And so when it goes to compute what happens along the elements, it says, okay, I have no movement, so I will not have any section force along my element. But then at the end of the of the calculations, it will have any way to have not all forces, so local forces, as I distinguish between these two at the beginning, that are in equilibrium with the external forces. So at the nodes, we will obtain um, an equivalent response for both of the elements. But then when we go look inside at, at the responses at the Gauss points, we will be able to see uh, what happens along the element only in the section, in, in the force beam column element, rather than in the displacement one. What happens if we discretize? If we discretize, we're going to be able to see everything that happens in between because these now are element um, results. So we have local forces along the whole element. So this is just for you to be aware that you need to be careful about how you read the results for these two types of elements because they can be misleading and you can think, oh, uh, I have no section forces, so it means I did not apply any, uh, any load. Instead, this is not the case. Just to recap again, so I know this may sound a bit te tedious, but uh, it's even complex for me to explain. So just to recap for you guys, displacement beam columns, um, they assume a continuous field of deformation along the elements, gives them to the section that provides stress results. Uh, compute strains that uh, from the displacement gives them to the section and provide stress results. Force beam elements instead assume a distribution of stresses along the elements and then compute the strains with an iterative process. Displacement beam column requires a finer mesh for nonlinear problems. Instead, in force beam columns, you saw that localization is captured even with one column element. So if you're studying material nonlinearity, you do not need to discretize your structure if you're using force beam column elements. The characteristic length in which the strain is localized in a displacement beam column is the length of the elements, the size of the element. Instead, in a force beam column is the Gauss point size. 
you can only use first main column in open seas to, to model shear. Uh, there are also other elements like the Timoshenko beam, but we like the one that we use the most is the first main column element. And for displacement beam columns, the element loads do not affect directly the sectional response. Instead, for the first main column, they do. So what you saw before, the sectional response here is not affected in the displacement beam column, but it is in the first main column. There are so many other types of elements in, in open seas that you can uh, that you can use. Wait, let's go here. Um, these are the ones that we will encounter in these classes. So we're not going to talk about others. There is like countless of elements in open seas, but uh, these are the only ones we're going to talk about in these classes. So zero length elements and inch beam to model concentrated plasticity, Mazarin field wall element and truss elements to model infill walls, and maybe the shell if we're going to actually talk about shear walls too. And we are going to discuss them more in detail once we get to the practice um, classes in which we're going to do like the full scale models. But for now, we're going to just, we just focused on the two beam column elements for you to really understand how they work. What I'd like you to do guys to, to do is to try and reproduce the structure from last time uh, in STKO and OpenSys2, instead of using a force beam column, using a displacement beam column and see what happens. And just to, let's say, get acquainted with these differences and all the things that can change if you use one element rather than the other. Thank you. Here there is Massimo who arrived. Maybe we can. Um, yeah, now you guys can see him too. I have questions, but let others start today. <laughs> She was, she was telling me at the beginning that she tried to make an equivalent frame model with a face and a surface load applied to the face. It's just a single box um, structure. Mm -hmm. Instead of using a edge, edge load, she used the surface load. The surface load, okay, the surface load. For it. Okay. Yeah, uh, and then she was having a problem, but I said that this should not be the problem because it is just, uh, if it's just one phase, you should yeah. not make give their give her problems. Yeah, right? exactly. So it shouldn't. It should, I shouldn't have a problem with that. I just apply like remember the the example you gave that one example five that one that's a huge huge building with the staircase. Yeah. So I I follow I follow more or less those uh, those uh, instructions. So I use the uh, surface load. So I applied like this was a one way slab uh, with the, well, I put the direction, the global orientation and, and which was the low, the, the surface load I wanted. And, but now I have an error, but. Uh, the error. I don't know what now, let me, <laughs> let me run it again. Okay. Because I close it. Okay. Here it um, Load generic surface load processing geometry. Uh, applied low and edge. Uh, oof, I don't know. Wait. Mm -hmm. I don't know what you say. I don't. Let me let me share my screen. I think I should allow you. Oh no, you're allowed. Ah, yeah. Can you see it? Yeah. This is what I get. So, but this was like 10 minutes before the class started. So I was uh, diving into the forum, trying to find some explanation. And this is why I, I haven't checked anything else. So it says problem creating time series for load pattern three. Uh, because load pattern three has no time series. As, as you can see there, while executing pattern plane three, zero. Zero means you forgot to assign a time series, the load pattern. Like a constant. Uh, no, you have to, if, if you want to use a constant time series, you have to create in the definition a constant time series, and then in the load pattern you select the time series because when you see a zero there, it means. Because, that, uh, okay. Yeah, it means that you forgot to assign a time series. Okay. Okay. So, so this this is this is my the structure I'm I'm trying to model. And I put also the rigid, the rigid links that we spoke last uh, class. Rigid diagram. But the thing is, I haven't like 
I cannot uh, uh, access to the to the um, uh, results, so I cannot see if my Richard links are actually there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so um, well, but uh, till now this was only only the problem. And the other thing is, uh, should masonry be highlighted like this? Masonry is a material. Is the material I I assign I to my peers and expanders. Uh, if it is blue like that, it mm -hmm. means that you also assign that material to something. To maybe maybe this, but I, I remove it. I remove it. Uh, control you, and unassign. Yeah, you can do this if you want to see if that material is, is assigned to something. Right click on the material and click assign and select. Sorry. Select. Right click and select. Okay. Is this okay. It was assigned to the, the interaction of the rigid diaphragm. Now you can drag and drop, pressing control. You can drag and drop the misery there. Yeah. And before releasing it, press control. Okay. okay now now misery becomes light blue. No, it's not. Because I what I did was I removed it from everything. And then I applied it again, but it kept on being blue. But <laughs> now, now I realize that this interaction, yeah, yeah, I have these problems. Uh, but I now realize the interaction was not merged or anything. So, okay, now I realize which was my, okay. Okay. I will try. I will try to to run it again and see if it works. Okay, guys. If anybody has has any more questions uh, regarding element properties, but also anything else that you're used doing in open season at TKO that you need help with, we have another 20 minutes to share with you. Also, if you have any other questions, any doubts about uh, the difference between force and displacement in columns, Pay a lot of attention to the topic of um, strain localization because almost everyone deals with concrete structure, but few people uh, pay attention to fracture energy regularization. And this is something that you have to learn. Can I ask you if this was a topic that you already discussed? that you already knew about, you knew how to handle in other softwares? I actually saw the, the video of Massimo during the weekend about this exactly, because okay. I was trying try <laughs> to find some solutions. I didn't understand anything. Did you understand something else now? No, yeah, you you know because at, at the end, like, well, I started the video and well, I didn't I didn't understood this discretization discretization thing because well, in my mind I was always like with force displacement one, so I don't discretize the beam. So then I wasn't understanding, but now now I understand. Okay. So, so this is this is the first time I I realized that I there's I a difference. Have, there is a difference exactly. I um, I don't know like in the in the other ones I use I don't remember making this difference, but well it's, it's been a while since the last time I use uh, a frame elements and like core I don't know uh, columns and beam for structure because now I I this I normally model sh uh, shear walls, but um, like you you have to be comfortable that that the, the explanation was quite good after one video this one was like okay now i understand the, <laughs> the other one so okay. thank you <laughs> enrique do you have a question uh, actually i do uh, now that larissa has mentioned uh, that she saw a document that uh, maximo said uh or, or regarding this particular uh, uh, thing that you look uh, that we're seeing right now is it is it possible for you to uh, like point me in the right direction to see where this document can be found on the website? So when you get like this presentation at the end, there's a lot of resources, and at the end there's also maximum open support group. 
and this video is like my presentation of today, but explained okay. way more in detail. And also there's some extra things that you can go read. For example, final and formulations for nonlinear analysis or some blog posts from Professor Scott that he also talks about these two element formulations and also integration options for elements in open seas for being column for force being column elements in open seas. I don't know if there's something else we can point him at, but uh, yeah, no, no, it's okay. Oh, okay. Uh, that, that's okay. Uh, you, you see, because uh, I've, I've been exploring the, the uh, STKO website. The only thing is that there's a lot of information and and videos that are one and a half hours. And, and, and to be honest with you, it's uh, it's it will be uh, helpful if uh, we kind of have a uh, a focus, a lens to to the, the most important topics. So just yeah. for, I think for people that are starting out, apart from our, let's say, classes that are shorter, and I mean, you already participated, so it's not really useful for you, but okay, I would say the first thing learning on modeling reference graphic frame structure is quite useful. There's also in Spanish. Okay. The third one. And then maybe you jump and you go to distributed plasticity here and lump plasticity here. Okay. And this one is also quite useful, common errors and convergence in in open season and SPKO. It actually talks about stuff we haven't really discussed yet, but I mean, you can go through it. And I think those are the most basic ones for yeah. people that start out. So let's say number two, five and seven and 13. Okay. All right. Yeah, uh, I will need to refresh. Uh uh this information and 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 try to make the model uh, i think larissa is uh uh is is doing a model that I, i'm actually kind of uh, in the same uh predicament because uh we also do a whole lot of uh, masonry design in 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 my state in in mexico and it's kind of the same it's kind of the same uh in all Latin America and, and Central America and Mexico. Uh, masonry is kind of the thing that we use to make houses and, and concrete. So it's uh, kind of the models that we do and, and or we want to do in open seas. So it's uh, concentrating on those particular items. Uh, it's, it's, it's important to me at, at this point. We will do 3D full frame structure of uh, my theory and concrete at the end of the. I'm kind of waiting for it to, to, to be honest with you. I, but... I know, it's just that the, <laughs> the series is intended for people to uh, learn SDK step by step. I understand that it's not something you do in three months, but then in one. But if I had to do a webinar per day, maybe I would just like not sleep anymore. <laughs> so. <laughs> Uh, I'm sorry that this space is not like suiting your needs for now, but the idea is to build up also uh, knowledge for future users. No, you no, guys no, are no. actually helping us understand if it works well, if it's explained in the right way. Uh, for for measuring frame structures, uh -huh. we do have some examples, but we don't have the for equivalent frame model. We haven't done we have any some examples, so probably we can put them in the post. Or actually, we can do something like this. You can you can ask a question on our forum about uh, measuring model with the equivalent frame uh, frame model, and we can post uh, some examples that we already created, but we didn't use in our webinar. So if you want, you can post a question there, and we can attach some of the models that we already have. Okay. But but answering your your your, uh, your comment, uh, it, it all the information is very useful, because at the end we also do uh, still design for buildings that are more that are taller than four uh, stories, and and yes, so say all the information that that we're gathering right now it's important, but to in 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 our in my case it is it is kind of a 
like waiting for for the masonry uh, masonry design, uh, designing walls and 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 uh, sheer walls and structures that are continuous in 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 masonry in total masonry. So it's 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 important. Everything is important. Yes. Perfect. And thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Okay, guys, today is um, quite crowd. Apart from Enrique and Larissa, yeah, Larissa has another question. So yeah, <laughs> I'm so sorry. This will be short. I I forgot I forgot I have it there. Right about this. Um, when I know that the local axes uh, are in the in the case of a three D frame are really important because of this, like all the all the columns should should have the the local axis in the same direction, but uh, what happened with the with this with the surface? Like you know, I, I have for example the the columns. All the x directions are let's say pointing downwards, and uh, the, the the surface of the, the the one that I should call the slab. Mm -hmm. How how should I match those um, uh, those uh, local axes with the columns, or the, or they should no. actually it, it is not. It is not important in, in your case, because in your case, you're going to apply a load in the global direction. In the so global direction. But imagine if you apply a surface load in the local direction, then it is important to, no. to make sure that the normal vector is pointing upward because you are going to apply a negative value. If you draw your surface with a, a negative normal vector, then you have to apply a positive value to apply a negative force, okay? So if you're working in global coordinates, it is not important. If you're working in local coordinates, of course, it is important. But the thing is, you should recommend that uh, if, even, even if afterwards we decide to, uh, to work with global uh, axis, when we do the, the when we when we do the, the geometry, we should be thinking all the time on the local axis just in case, uh, I don't know, for later things. Uh, yeah. and like always like point everything downwards or everything upwards and like uh, in one direction like left to right or right to left and when you are doing some uh, simple model like a building where basically the surface are flat because you only have slabs then yes if you, if you start learning how to be clean in your model so you put everything pointing up or so with local axes that are uh, coherent it's better for you because you learn how to create a clean model. But that's not mandatory. The important thing is that you know uh, what a local axis is doing, okay? So even if you have columns with negative local axis, it is fine. As far as you know that a negative load will point upward. So that, that's the only, the only point. Okay, okay, thank you. Remember that once you created something with a specific local axis, if you want to change it and reverse it or make it coherent, uh, the characteristic axis in this yeah. case, then if you move it, that will be lost. So if I create a face here and now it's pointing downwards, I want to reverse it. But then I take my whole structure and I move it from here to here, it will go down again. Yeah, because this is something that we added later on. So when we transform a serve, when we transform a geometry, we also transfer all the previous information to the new geometry. But we didn't do it for the local for the uh, reverse local axis. So it's something that we are going to, to add in the new version. Just like for because sometimes if you have a large model and you are reversing everything and then realize you need to explode it or move, move it and all your reverse operation would be you have to do them again okay so today is a quiet class you guys try to come more pumped for next week uh, next week we talk about I don't remember now. Okay. Definitions are conditions. So that, that thing that 
Larissa had a mistake today uh, in reference to the time series and the uh, load pattern we would have discussed it. So you're always ahead of us. And yeah, thank you for participating. If you guys any, have any more questions, just post them on the forum. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thanks to you, Enrique. I'm glad it was clear. See you again next week. Have a good. Thank you very much. Day, evening. Whatever it is. Whatever it is in your time zone.